Good afternoon and welcome everybody. This would be the Jeff Cameron Show from a car, from a car, traveling to Charlotte. We are uh, we are on the go these days. I'm Jeff, Tom is with me in the passenger seat. Director Matthew is the one who's sending off the clips back to the radio station. So if you're listening on 93.3, Real Talk Radio, we appreciate it. You can't really watch it, I don't suppose, on War Chant TV. You just see a screen. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> director Ben, the second director, is going to put up there's the logo of the show, and then there it'll be go. on YouTube. There you so. go. Hello, YouTubers. There you go. So on uh, Twitter, it's at Cameron Show, as always. And you podcasters, you know the deal. All right, so we have to go to Charlotte, but we did not want to miss out on my first day back in the States. Uh, it's, a, it's a whirlwind, or at least first day back to be able to broadcast. And uh, back from Ireland, now to Charlotte, football begins. I always think, Tom, football begins when we make this trip. Yeah. And this is the indicator. That's why it was weird for me last year when I didn't go. Um, the yeah, year before. Yeah, yeah. It was, so it's been strange for me not to be here uh, because this is always the signifier that it's ramp-up time and it's all things football. It's kind of like you turn the, the switch. We apologize for the quality, but this is what happens when you have to record while driving to Charlotte. It says we will be in Charlotte tonight around uh, 7.15. Or no, check that, 6.50. And that means we'll be there at 4. That's correct. So <laughs> I'm setting the personal over-under for uh, 6.05. Yeah, we'll, we'll see, we'll see. Uh, that said, I am excited because this is probably the most uh, obviously anticipated season. I, I hesitate to sometimes say that. Um, most anticipated season in the last five, six years because we were really excited when Willie came in and we thought that, yeah. you know, things would change. And I remember the expectation of that Virginia Tech game. We were sky high. Of course, it didn't take long for that uh, dream to be shattered and for all of us to be left in ruins, including the program remaining as a status quo uh, dumpster fire. Uh, but, but, but this, to me, is the first time where we've had expectations uh, that are pseudo championship level. Yeah. So when Willie was here, it was just like, okay, we we want to see a modicum of improvement. Fast offense, a lot of points. Right. Yeah. Right. You know, lethal simplicity, <laughs> which is comical <laughs> to say out loud now, but but it, it was simple. Uh, but but now you're talking about, I think, legitimized expectations. Florida State. You know, we got questions. We did seminal headlines hour two last night, which is going to be hour one tomorrow. And we had headliner questions. And a lot of the questions centered around just how good the offense was. But one of them was, what what could go wrong with this offense? Is there an element of it that you're a little nervous about or intrigued by or an area that you're not real sure about? And, Tom, that question elicited an interesting response from the three of us, which was, no. <laughs> no, there's yeah, nothing yeah, about yeah. this offense that I'm worried about. There, there, there's nothing. They have a deep offensive line. They have a bevy of running backs. They now have plus-plus tight ends. They now have a depth at wide receiver that is, I think, you know, amongst the elite in the ACC, if not the best. They have a quarterback that's a Heisman candidate. I mean, honestly, you trust Atkins and Norvell. That combination produces game plan after game plan that we're satisfied with. I, I don't. What would you say you're nervous about? There really isn't anything. So as we traverse to Charlotte, we do so with that same energy that the fan base has as we know football gets started. Let's go see this great fireworks show this year and hope that the defense comes along for the ride and plays well enough for us to win a lot of games. Yeah, my number one thing nerves-wise is uh, an over-rotation of bodies when it might be working simply with one thing or one player. It could be the passing game is working, but, you know, Johnny's out there and Keon Coleman are obviously your two base players. But then there are a lot of sets where Darion Williamson and Winston Wright are out there and, and Kentron's out there, and you're like, man... Can these guys get into a rhythm? Can we allow our, our top players to get into a rhythm? Because I get that you want to be fresh, but it just seems like we're rotating bodies for the sake of rotating bodies. They did that in the bowl game. However, bowl games are different. So I understand that. But I could see a place where the offense is so multiple that maybe by halftime you sputtered in situations that you didn't think you were going to sputter in. And, and as we approach halftime, we're breaking it down in our minds. We say well, what did we establish in the first half? What are we about today? Now, the check and balance with that is the game plan week to week is so solid. Consistently, the proof has been 
that it's solid with Mike Norvell. It's solid with Alex Atkins. Jordan Travis has proven that he is, you know, player agnostic. If the play demands and the coverage demands that he has to go a certain way with the ball, he goes that way with the ball. But it's just when you have so many good players, sometimes that creates a complication because you try to do a little bit of everything rather than stick to what is going to work. But you could just counter that and say, use that word, counter, Miami. They realized all they had to do was run that play over and over and over again, and they did so to the tune of 45-3. to That's where I, I just have a little bit of concern is you could say, guys, just pick one thing and be that this week. I feel like Mike's done a very good job, though, of taking what defenses give him. I think he's done a very good job of game planning for those attacking those weaknesses of an opposing defense. And I think he's done a good job adjusting to defenses attempting to take something away relatively quickly. You know, like I think probably about a full quarter is the most that he's ever spent sort of, uh, you know, toiling uh, away with this idea that this is what we want to do, and I'm yelling at the TV or I'm right, yelling in right. the stands, hey, they've taken that away, my man, let's yeah, go. Yeah. You know, But I don't really ever recall a time where we're two and a half quarters into the game and I'm going, dude, are you going to wake up? They've taken this away. Right. Well, or, you know, it's just enough with the gimmicks. Yeah. Jacksonville State, why wow, we got two quarterbacks on the field well, at the same that was, time. Yeah, that's a that's a low but, watermark. <laughs> but part of it also is, and the NC State game was clunky last year, and that was there was – it was like a bone on bone. There was no cartilage in there, man, with Jordan and the coaching staff. You could see that there were disagreements, and that carried over from Wake. You saw that in the Wake game as yeah. well. Yeah. Jordan figured it out, obviously, and they were definitely on the same page as the season meandered on. But, I mean, you could perhaps see something like that. Or, you know, Trey Benson starts out hot, and then we rotate in, and it's Toophilia Rodney Hill, and it sputters for a drive or two. You go, uh, why don't we just leave Trey in? You know, things like that. Well, I think, I, yeah, I do think that if I'm listening to this right now and thinking to myself, well, you know, he got cued an awful lot down in the red zone. Yeah. Now, yeah. that is the, the, the lone criticism that remains from last year. There were moments where they were a little more exotic than I needed them to be <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, down in the red zone. The problem is, though, they didn't feel like they could block it up consistently against Correct. a good defensive line or a stacked box. And, and they were correct. They were correct. And I think, truthfully, though, we've seen now, short of the Eagles with what they do, there aren't too many teams that can really run against these massive defensive lines where they stack the box and come up and you've got seven people in the box, eight people in the box down on the goal line. So coaches do tend to just kind of give up on that and say, I'm not trying to do this. I mean, we're not going to be able to budge them. So I've got speed out on the perimeter. I've got a yeah. quarterback that can move. I'm going to – you know, I'll, I'll loosen things up a little bit. It's a balancing act to bludgeon or to just stop hitting your head against the wall. Correct. But I, I think the nuance here is this year you should be able to do those things yeah, against most muscles. everybody on the yeah. schedule. Last year you were having to call exotic things on the goal line against Louisville. You know, and it wasn't just the Clemson and the LSU games. and It was against mid-tier ACC teams. And I think that's the leap that we expect to see this year and we hope to see and we should see, which is when you're playing Wake and you're playing, uh, we're not playing Louisville this year, but Pitt on the road, you know, can you line up third and one, tell the world what you're going to do and just impose your will? That that should be the leap that we take with this offensive line this year. I wish we were playing Louisville this year because Lord knows they're not playing anybody. I mean, that team doesn't have a, a single tough game on their <laughs> schedule. Yeah. Good Lord. Uh, yeah, I, I will say, too, that I, I have said this even – since they've arrived with Keon Coleman, you know, we, we realized that, you know, in the offseason, I, I kind of said, listen, we need to add a receiver. I, I didn't feel like yeah. we had a truly established number two that you could trust. I, I Portier did a great job in spring, felt like he was progressing. I didn't know whether or not that was uh, a suitable big game, good defense number two. I thought right. it was a, a nice... Could be, could but be, not definite. Not, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And so Coleman, you know, is that. And yeah. he may end up being the one. We don't even know. It's, yeah. it's like he's that talented. So now that what that does is that slot sports here where he should be, which is a solid to good three. Yep. And then from there, you, you probably need... I mean, you got to have proof that Vendravius, Vendravius Jacobs is going to be all that on game day certainly was in the spring, but he's never played in a college football game before, so 
Does he hit the ground running in the slot against LSU? I don't know. It could be a big moment for him. Right. Um, and we don't know about Winston Wright. So I guess if you needed to really push it and say, come up with something you're concerned about, I, I might say that the wide receiving core being a little inconsistent once you get past the top two? Yeah, I think that, well, that's one of the questions for Norvell this week. And again, Florida State's on Wednesday at the ACC kickoff. It would be, how explosive has Winston Wright been in off-season workouts? Which is a shortened to the point question. And if, he, and if his eyes light up, that'll tell you, oh, oh, wait a minute. Yeah, We've got something here. I hope they do. I hope they do for that young man. Yeah, me too. I'm rooting for him, man. I, I just, that's a sorry way to have your career uh, kind of stunted the way that it was. Just a stupid car accident not his fault I, I just hate that yeah i agree but in that group of slot guys if you've got somebody from the crew of winston or vandravius or destin hill or jakai douglas destin hill is like the x factor man if, if that kid yep. is ready to play and is in great shape and we already know he's got blinding speed you saw the other players line up when they were asked about him trey vincent's eyes told you a story they did so I don't know, man. Maybe, well, maybe it's they special do. teams at yeah. minimum, right? Yeah, I maybe mean, they have something there. I can't wait for fall camp to find out. You'll, we're going to know within a day or two if if the speed and explosiveness is there for everybody involved. You know, that's shorts can tell you about explosiveness. It can't tell you about toughness and all that other stuff. But you know, Winston will look different even in shorts before acclimation is done than he did in spring. Uh, in, in explosiveness. If he's got it in, and we'll see it at that point. Because what else do you have to lose? Now it's time to turn it up. It's full go, Winston, right? Yeah. And then same thing with Destin. You know, how does that speed play on the field against these, you know, veteran bodies in the secondary? We've got some guys who can run stride for stride with a burner. Not a ton in the secondary, but there are a couple of dudes. So, you know, that's where I, I always look forward to seeing the first couple of days of camp and how who hit the gym. You know, who's in great shape? Who's taking that next step forward? But then also you can just see speed, relative speed. Then after you look for those things, you're just waiting for them to put the full pads on and get to the next step. But Mike Norvell, now that the coaching staff can be a little bit more involved in summer workouts because of rule changes in the past couple of years, he'll be able to tell us something with a little bit more conviction when he gets up to Charlotte on Wednesday. Yeah, and I have a sense that this group is bonded to the place where they hold each other accountable. I don't think you're going to have a situation where we're – look at off-season workouts and say, what happened to that guy? He doesn't seem right. to be up to par with everybody else. I, I don't think that's going to happen. I think it's a group that is really locked in. Uh, and, and for that reason, again, it's hard to find reasons to really wring your hands over an offense. It always comes back to the defense. This whole season comes back to the defense, in my opinion. Uh, and this whole season will really, I think, turn on whether or not they can be good to very good on defense. Yeah. And if the answer is yes to that, well, can you bar the door? They could be a contender to play in the college football playoff. It's Jeff Cameron Show driving along I-10 right now, gang. Long ways to go. 93.3 Real Talk Radio War Chant TV. We're talking about the defense a moment ago, and uh, you know, I really, I want to say that I, I hope, really hope, because we're on our way to Charlotte, and we got a lot of time to think about the things we're excited about, things we're nervous about, things we anticipate happening as camp gets underway. We think probably August third or fourth. So, I, I I think about Kalen Deloach being here, and I think about that selection. And when you realize that young man was recruited and committed in 2018, mm-hmm. yeah, eons ago, then you really want to root for a guy like that because he's hung in there and he's been through a lot. He's seen some things. He's seen some things, and most of them haven't been good. And then even last year. I know that there's some metrics that suggest that they were very good at linebacker last year. I, I push back on that a little bit. There were moments in time where they were good. I also know they were injured. And Tatum Bethune said that in his availability without yeah. getting specific. And he talked about having a lower body and an upper body injury. And it was evident to me. I mean, towards the end of the year, it was really evident. They couldn't stop anybody. Teams just lined up and ran the ball on them. And they were banged up on the defensive line. They were short handed on the defensive line. Linebackers were hurt so they couldn't take on blocks and try to run around plays, and we were getting gashed. I mean, Florida did it, Oklahoma did it. You know, they really struggled against teams that had um, you know, plus players on the offensive line, and Florida certainly did. I mean, they manhandled our guys, they did. and that was uh, disappointing. So, I think with a much deeper defensive line, a, a greater uh, set of 
you know, waves of talent that we're going to put out there. They'll be cleaner at linebacker. And Deloach, when healthy, is a good player. And I wanted to clarify that for people. When I'm critical, it's that I'm holding these guys to a very high standard. We're pursuing excellence. We're pursuing championships. We're pursuing a conference title. We're doing all these things. They can be even better. But he's capable of that when he's healthy. He just wasn't very healthy last year at various times. And so all that shot out of a cannon speed that we had seen at the beginning of the year, including in the LSU game, was gone uh, pretty much by the midway point, I yeah, thought. Yeah. And so I'm rooting for him to stay healthy and, and, and have the kind of year he's capable of because, frankly, he can be a good player and he can get paid. He can go to the league. And, and, and have a career. I think he's capable of playing in the NFL. So I'm rooting for him to be healthy and, and to have the kind of year he's capable of. It'd be fun to talk to him. Yeah, I think he he's capable of being a, an NFL player. I don't know, you know, beyond a professional and make, making some money at contract, second contract. I don't know if he's a starting no, linebacker. No, in the I don't NFL. think he's a star or anything like that. But he's got that play. speed. Yeah, he's he, got that speed. He'll be on a special team somewhere right yeah. off the bat, yeah. and that'll allow him to make a team and get drafted. If he's healthy again, and then maybe work your way up. You the know? hard, you know, the hard part for him, you know, beyond the injury last year is you've had so many different coaches yeah. over your tenure, teaching you so many different principles and keys and rules and tips and tricks. Some of them were terrible at their job. I mean, really, and you've had dysfunction galore. So it stunts your growth and your development. And you saw it click a couple of seasons ago towards the end where he, he understood what offenses were doing running at him. Uh, last year, I mean, the speed was evident against two of the fastest quarterbacks in the country. It yeah. wasn't like yeah. these are mobile quarterbacks. It's No, these are like the fastest. If you look at um, Jaden Daniels, it, uh, Sports Info Solutions put out uh, an elusiveness rate uh, publicly because sometimes they put this stuff on their social media. And Jaden Daniels was far and away number one when it comes to broken plays and elusiveness and the difficulty oh, of that job. The whole first half of the season, it was their offense. Correct. Now, but he's, he's credit, exceptional he grew up. at it. Well, and he, and he grew up. He actually started yeah. making throws in the second half of the season. You're not going to run around and just beat Alabama. You got you got to throw Correct. the ball. You got to make plays, and he did. He got better. Well, that's also a, you know credit to Brian Kelly for coming off of what he loves to do and figuring out yeah, in the middle. Coach, where, man, where, I've said know. it before. He's a good coach, and none of our fans want to believe that he is. He's a good coach. Now, listen, uh, I'm not telling you he's Nick Saban, but he's a good coach. Correct. And you know, I don't know that Malik Cunningham was that much farther down the list. Didn't see the whole list, but I'm sure Malik Cunningham was up there because yeah. good Malik Cunningham is a freaking headache and a half. So for him to be able to go stride for stride with those guys says something. But he did make a couple of plays towards the end of camp downhill, and you're thinking, okay, there's the trigger. There's the suddenness. It looks to be maybe on its way back. A huge part of it, though, was the defensive line. I just I can't ignore that fact. It's much like in, in all those years when we were struggling on offense, you'd come back and you'd talk about the offensive line. I just have a hard time defining the back seven as they are this or they are that without a good front, without a good front and a healthy front four. I think at that point it becomes a fair assessment of what we are at linebacker, what we are in the secondary. I have high hopes for the middle of the defense this year. Uh, you know, the two linebackers that are healthy, yep, I think they're going to be better and improved. Greedy Vance got better and better last year. He's going to be your slot corner. I think you could set that and forget that. Shaheem Brown, how healthy is he? But if he is, what can that do for your defense? At that point when you combine that with the guys that you have in the interior, it becomes fun because the middle of the defense is set, and now you can mix and match on the outside to find the, the proper combinations. But I just think that the middle, it's, it's you say a lot in baseball, it's up the middle. It's your catcher, it's your pitcher, it's your middle infield, and your center fielder. I think Florida State defensively is getting to a point where it can start to get fun, and then you'll have no excuse if you're terrible this year uh, on the outside in the secondary. Uh, yeah, no, you'll end up firing your defense coordinator and you'll move on. That's what will happen. But this is a big year for Adam Fuller. He's got a chance to prove himself and take another big step forward now that he's got some pieces to work with. I think Shaheen Brown has a chance to be a superstar. I really do. I think he's an athletic player. I think he's long. I think he's confident. I think he's a kid that, when healthy, is capable of being uh, maybe a star. So, I mean, I really like him. And He's a modern-day hybrid player. You know, it's somewhere between safety and, and linebacker. Yeah. Yeah, he is, and, and he's, I think, very, very athletic. He did not have a great camp. He wasn't healthy. That is, uh, 
you know, again, something you cross your fingers about. We've had several guys that look like good players but didn't have great camps. You know, Pintrell Cypress did not have a great camp. Correct. Uh, Shaheen was playing through injury. He didn't have a great camp. I didn't think. I thought he was just kind of pedestrian. I'm glad you finally passed this guy. Yeah, this was really eating at me. I needed to get beyond these other people. <laughs> I forgot we were doing a radio show. <laughs> <That's great. laughs> if you heard some perturbedness in Jeff's voice, it wasn't about defensively where Florida State is. No. It's that this guy is sitting in the left lane going like two over the speed limit. Yeah, and refusing to get over no matter how many people pass him. Um, <laughs> refusing. So that's uh, troubling. But we're back. Now we're cruising right along. And we've got construction. <laughs> ah, nothing like a podcast on the road. Get the play-by-play. But, uh, yeah, I think Shaheen is going to be a really big-time player uh, for Florida State's defense this year with all that's going on up front. That pass rush is going to force the ball to come out a little bit sooner yep. than they'd like. Mm-hmm. I think uh, you're going to – Look alive on, if you're a member of the secondary, right? Yeah, what a, what a year they should have. We can finally get back to ball hawking, putting people in obvious downs and distance, uh, jumping routes. You can take some chances when you trust the guy behind you. You take some chances when you're up two and three scores. Yep. That's when defense becomes really fun. You, you get a couple of gift turnovers yeah. because the quarterback panics. You yeah. know it, That can happen still in this modern age of college football where teams rack up 30 points on the regular, 30-plus. That can still happen where you go, what was he doing? It's because his mind is moving well, he's fast. Sped up. Yeah, he's yeah. sped up. Yeah, he's sped up based on he's been hit several times, and you know that internal clock is going off, and it's been a second and a half, and Jared Verst is already – you know, hit him in the small of the back the last time they had the ball. So, you know, that is, that's the stuff that you get excited about. I think that is a distinct possibility. Maybe not against LSU, per se. And, again, we have two halves of this season that I think are going to play out very differently because you have two of your best games in the first four where the opponent is uh, on scholarship and has a little something to do with uh, how the games play out, and uh, they're all on scholarship, but these kids can do something about it. They've got the requisite athleticism, uh, and so it, it will be fascinating. But you just got to survive those games and get a win somewhere in there, one of the two, and you're going to be set for the second half of the season in which you're going to be facing many overmatched teams, in my opinion. You have a chance to really kind of boat race some folks. Yeah, no, I think that the month of October will provide you opportunities. I'll be interested to hear what... You know, Coach Elko says up from Duke this week at the kickoff. I believe that's Tuesday, as in tomorrow. Um, interested to hear what he thinks of his team because that is the one potential threat in October in that slate of home games where you play Virginia Tech and Duke and Syracuse. Duke would be the one you circle. Crazy times that we live in that that's the team that you would, not Virginia Miami Tech. circles with it at the start of every <laughs> yes, year. Yes, they do. Yeah. Well, rivalry games big, are like that. Big you know? matchup, big but, matchup. you know, that Virginia Tech is where you're like, ah, no big deal. But, I mean, you get my point. After the bye week, after that tough quartet, well, two of the first four games, that post-bye, you've got three consecutive home games that should all be laughers in the second half to different degrees, but they should all be laughers. And at that point, it's the final sprint. You get Wake and Pitt and Miami, then a bit of a break before Florida. But you're right. It does break up into two very different segments on the calendar. And the good news is for us that because the back half of the schedule has some easier games – even though you have a relatively early bye, you should be able to rotate a lot of bodies for the final eight games to keep yourself fresh because our eyes on Charlotte coming back here in December to play again. But if you want to be in good shape for that game, take care of business and get those backups in there so you're fresh down the stretch. The standard at Clemson for a long time, I brought this up years ago, I brought it up recently on the show, was always that they played an insane number of players. I was always very impressed. Once they started recruiting well, if you looked at the game logs, you'd you'd be just... I'd be mad because we couldn't afford to do that. We didn't have the requisite depth. And then I'd look at all the kids that played, and I'd be like, golly, they played this many guys or this many guys. And you just knew that that kind of seasoning was going to pretend of really good things moving forward. Oh, man, I, I remember... Was it Bryant was the quarterback for them? I forget. But they're playing on the road at Louisville. This is one of their marquee games. This is six years ago, maybe. And it was the threat on the schedule for them because we weren't. And they end up pulling away in the second half. They're blowing them out. And they bring out a freshman by the name of ETN. You know? <laughs> yeah, and it's yeah. the second to last drive in the game. And he breaks one off for 75 yards. I'm like, oh, my God, they, they've got one. Like, that dude is a freak. Yeah. And he's third on their depth chart right now. 
Like, we need to get back there ourselves. We thought that about a lot of players over the last... Rodney Hill may be that guy. He could be. You could, you know, that maybe maybe Clemson fans are watching Florida State later in the year, and they're like, really? Who the hell is that guy? You know, and... Who's yeah. this receiver? Who's who's this Hakeem? Play? You know, like, like oh, you yeah. want them. Well, to be, Dre Jacobs, right? Yeah. You yeah. want them to be like, okay, they're turning the corner here. So uh, it's a distinct possibility. Jeff Cameron Show 93.3, Real Talk Radio. Or Chantini as we broadcast on the road to Charlotte. Back for more in a minute. Guys, our next partner is AG1, the daily foundational nutritional supplement that supports whole body health. I drink it quite literally every single day. I began using AG1 because, I'll be honest with you, I don't like to take a bunch of pills and vitamins, and I just wanted something that tastes great, was quick, and easy to remember, so I do it. I do it every morning when I wake up. I certainly have it right after my coffee and before I work out, and I will tell you this, too. It is um, a simple, effective investment for your health. You can try AG1 and get five free AG1 travel packs and a free one-year supply of vitamin D with your first purchase. Go to drinkag1.com slash JCS. Again, that's go to, uh, all you got to do is go to uh, drinkag1.com slash JCS. That's drinkag1.com slash JCS. Check it out. It's delicious. It's quick. It's easy. It's proven. Vitamins, probiotics, whole food source nutrients. Start your day with it. You'll feel better. I promise. Suffice to say, the uh, trek down I-10 is not as sight to behold feeling that I had in Ireland. It's just a, <laughs> What, this countryside doesn't look the same? No, no, not the rolling hills. We saw, Tom, we saw, this is hilarious. I have a picture of it out to show you, and I meant to post it. We're, we're driving along out to Waterford, a couple hour drive away from Dublin, and as we're driving uh, with our driver, Ken, great guy, uh, we look up one of the bridges over the top of the road and we just see this sea of cows crossing the bridge are they the scottish style with the long hair so those exist yes but we did not see those we saw regular cows in ireland this time around uh i was hoping that we would see those long-haired cows yeah yeah (laughs) uh but we didn't but uh, yeah these were just your classic Black spotted white cows okay, just yeah. walking across a bridge. They were hilarious. <laughs> They're just doo 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 looking down on the traffic below. Uh, we were having we were having a good chuckle with that. Uh, but they, they yeah, <laughs> those are beautiful big hills and valleys and every because it rains there so much it's just lush green and uh, with the with the fescue off to the side blowing in the wind and the what is it, the hither? Is that, you know, I mean, whatever, sure. whatever it is. Yeah, it was remarkable. Um, and I, it's the, the time adjustment has been one thing. The heat and humidity adjustment has been a much <laughs> different deal. It was, it never got above 70 when we were in Ireland. It was 68 and uh, sunny and no humidity. It's not going to be much better in Charlotte either. I will tell you, I got off the plane in Orlando. We, Ira and Aslan and I walked outside, and it was just a big, get you some, welcome to Florida, a-holes, and uh, just a blanket. You should have seen the faces of the Irish flying over to go to Disney World, right? <laughs> all right, so we're all on this plane, Aer Lingus, we're flying in, and we're probably 20 minutes from landing, and the guy comes on, and he tells everybody that it's close to 40 degrees Celsius. Yep. And I'm in my head trying to do the conversion, and I'm thinking, that's 100. That's like 100. Yeah. And uh, the little kid to my left turns to his dad and goes, that's, that's, that can't be. And the dad's <laughs> like, yeah, it's going to be 100 degrees. And uh, he goes, I didn't think it got that hot. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, buddy. Uh, it's the stuff of uh, legend. But, yeah, it's not supposed to be 100, but... It was in Orlando. Mm, mm, You're right. Not going to be better in Charlotte. So uh, were all three of you guys converted to be... Celsius? No, well, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you want to live in Ireland at some point. Do they now want to live in Ireland at some point? I don't know if they want to live in Ireland. They enjoyed it. They liked it a lot. They certainly wouldn't mind spending half the year there, I think. Yeah, uh, the people yeah. were great. and It was... Uh, you know, the one... There's only one aspect of Ireland, which is actually true of England and Wales and Scotland and places like that. One aspect I don't like, and that is their food sucks. They don't really have very good food. Uh, Now, we did get fish and chips at Dunmore East. 
uh, and it was delicious because it's right on the sea, mm -hmm. and you're getting it that day from that source, and it was very, very well done. But uh, they do good breakfast. That's about it. Yeah. That's yeah. about it. Yeah, yeah, you get your bangers and all that. Right. You just hope to find. It. This is uh, when I was in London. I was very happy to find that there was, you know, restaurants. If you go to an Italian restaurant, Italians own the damn thing. Right. You know, so you can go to not like some dude who want, who throws up Fat Tony's right. Italian yeah. restaurant yes. and yes. like he's from Sheboygan. Right. Like you know, it's legit. Italian people run this restaurant. I don't know if they make it to Ireland, but they do make it to London and, well, and England. The, my favorite meals in uh, where we're on an excursion here. My favorite meals in London are always Indian, uh, for the history, of course. And so you have incredible Indian food there. Yeah. But uh, in Ireland, uh, no, no, pretty much. Now you, they, they've got plenty of steak, a lot of cows. Yeah. You're all yeah. right there. But everything else, you're kind of like, well, yeah. The, you got to get the fish and chips, which are French fries, of course. But, yeah. Uh, I'm, was, gonna, was, I'm gonna figure something out there. Yeah. Yeah. You got to figure something out. Not. Not. Great food selections, but everything else I rather enjoyed. I, I looked like a fool. Tom knows this. And we'll get back to FSU. I looked like a fool when I got into the hotel in Dublin. And <laughs> I, I'd forgotten that in Europe and a lot of places in Europe, the hotels are set up differently. When you get into your hotel room, you have to take your entry key card and put it in the slot that's just inside the doorway. It's like a little box next to the light switch. And you have to put the key card in there, and that turns on all the power in your room. It's a way of saving energy. It's actually quite efficient. It's smart. Uh, yeah. We don't do it here. We should probably do it. We should but, probably do it. Yeah. But I looked like a fool. I kept trying to flip the light switches, and I, what is going on? I can't turn on any of these lights. And then finally, I saw a maid outside, and I even, I mean, I offered it up. I said, ma'am, I'm sure this is because I'm American and clueless, and you must get this often. But what's going on with the lights in here? And she chuckled. And she's like, she, all she said, she didn't say anything. She pointed at the box that was, because uh, I was propped against the door. Yeah. She pointed at the box, and I was like, oh, right, key, yeah, the card, got it, thank you. And she chuckled. That's fine. She's used to it. I'm sure she's used to it. Yeah, but probably. from that point on, uh, I was good to go no matter what hotel we were staying in. So it was, it was ideal. All right, back to the uh, topic at hand here as we go to Charlotte. And I guess, is there any other aspect, Tom, I would ask you this, because I was trying to think about this last night when I went to bed. Is there anything I'm really interested in with the other teams, uh, namely those that are on our schedule? And, and the answer is yes. Obviously, I'm curious to hear what Cristobal has to say, and we're going to interview Cristobal. Yep. Uh, you get Van Dyke and Cristobal tomorrow. I do, and I'm intrigued by that because Van Dyke, you know, I, I was very high on early on in his career at Miami there, and even though we beat him here in that incredible comeback and the fourth and 14 conversion and yeah. all the goodness but you know I, I thought I thought he was a good player a plus player that was moving in the right direction took a massive step back last year the offense really sputtered struggled he got hurt uh they new fire offense, their OC uh, after one year after <laughs> one, one, year, one year seemed like a, an absurd hire to begin with um you know like when you're sitting around talking hey who do we want to engineer our offense the guy from michigan no yeah, right. hey, uh, so they, yeah that's what they did uh they fired him so we'll see but uh, he to me he's got the talent to be a good player again if he if he trusts it and then obviously crystal Bowl's in year two right is it year two yes yeah, so he's, he's got to get this thing moving in the right direction he's already had to change coordinators after one year that's that's not a that's good a start. toughie that's yeah. A, yeah it's not not ideal it's not what you're looking to do so those expectations for them and what kind of team they think they have i'll be intrigued by Obviously, I'm interested in Pitt because we played them in November up there. It's a good program, man. That's a really solid Get program. Getting Narduzzi. Yeah, that good, should yeah. be interesting. Well, I mean, you know, he's <laughs> probably rugged. But yeah, yeah. listen, that's a guy that has done a good job at Pitt. You know, he's not a dynamic coach. He's not a guy that always makes the best decisions in the red zone. But he's conservative. He plays a style. They have an identity. They are very physical. Yeah, they do run the yeah. ball. They can play. I'm good sure team. you'll ask about that in a second. Like, when did that begin? How did they forge that kind of identity? I like that aspect of their program. It's not they're like you nasty. ever sit. Yeah, you never sit down and watch a pit game and think they're going to be soft. Yeah. You know. So Correct. I mean, I, I mean, that's that's uh, that's old school, and I enjoy that. Um, so there's that. I. I I don't know about anybody else that we're talking to. I certainly don't care about talking to the Georgia Tech player that we have scheduled for tomorrow. We may skip it and just tell him not to come over. Um, I mean, what the hell is he going to talk about? Uh, so there's that. I guess uh, I'm interested to hear from the commissioner. I don't know. Somebody asked me, 
is there anything that he could say that would make you feel any better about the prospects of the ACC moving forward? And short of a new contract, a television deal that he announces at the opening press conference with ESPN, no, no, no he, there's really nothing he, he can he, say. He's gonna, they're going to have a slide, I promise you, and I can't wait for this. Because they've got the, the big marquee behind them and, and the board is it's all oh, yeah. futuristic and, and very high tech. It's a good presentation if you didn't know that the conference was poor. But they're going to have a slide where the CW logo pops up when they're talking about (laughs) over-the-air broadcast partners for Saturdays. I can't wait for that. We need to capture that image. The CW. The CW with Jim Phillips talking in front of it. Come on, man. That is the picture we need. Well, and as we exit the conference, we can say, this was the moment. We saw the CW. He's going to have to fend off a question or two at minimum about Northwestern, too. Well, that's probably he's gonna want to get that out of the way quick. I would, I would almost. I mean, you don't want to open with that, but I, I would think you would address it on your own pretty quickly. You know, he has said his quote, his exact quote, was that he had no idea that was going on, and he looks forward to vigorously defending his reputation. And yes, uh, I would like yeah. to vigorously defend that I was aloof to several programs under my purview, allowing for a culture of sexual assault. That's great. I'm actually. How do you? You can't come back from that. It's a toughie. I, when that first broke, you were over there. Yeah. When that first broke, my immediate thought was, how the hell can the ACC let this guy speak? How can you let this guy speak? Yeah, I mean, he's a com- – yeah, I mean, that's that's tough. He's an athletic director that, you know, I mean, I, you are accountable. Apparently, however, this is a culture that dates back to Darnell and many others. Like, I, there's an article that came out yesterday that said – that this has been going on for more than a decade. Like, yeah. the preceding program. I mean, like, the, the, the yeah. people that were there but, before him. It, it, I'm not it, giving him a pass. I'm saying that coach to coach to coach allowed yeah. this to go on. That's crazy. Walker yeah. and others. It is. I, I, if that's true, that's wild. But, yeah. but my point is, I don't know how that happens. it's kind of like the, the line in Casino, you know, when uh, the nepotism hire at the, in the pit. He's like, either you're in on it or you're too, or you're dumb enough not to see it. Either way, you're out. Yeah, yeah, you know? yeah, 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 yeah. Like, I just, when, when you think about it that way, and I, I don't know if, if the ACC has a board. I'm assuming that there's a board that makes a hire for the commissioner and has some sort of check and balance Tell power. Tell you what, though, Tom. But I mean, let's you say want they, that guy to be front-facing for you right now? You don't, but the problem you have is who's taking that job? So you fire him, who are you getting? Nobody wants to be the commissioner of the ACC right now. Yeah. I mean, can you imagine? Sure, I'll take over this dead man walking. I mean... What what we need to see is John C. McGinley and, and the spinoff <laughs> firm show up and be like, yeah, there it is. Spin off the assets, baby. Cut I, yourself a deal. I am curious what they'll have to say. There was so much pushback after last year's ACC kickoff. I mean, that the story, you recall, you called me from Charlotte, and Ooh. I was like, Tom. This man. I was in the room. I could not fathom that that guy went with the. Uh, we all need to have nice neighborhoods. I mean, what? What in the world? You, <laughs> what? They've shown you around every turn who they are. <laughs> they just cut out the knees from the Big Twelve. Like a month earlier. Maybe they can have a gate attendant with a gate right next to the stage. So when he comes up, he has to go to the gate attendant. (laughs) Look at this. Yeah. Isn't this lovely? We have to have our trash collected as well. It was so bizarre. I couldn't believe it. I said in my head, I go, Sankey told you who he is. Yeah. He has not an ounce of concern for your well-being, well, sir. More, more importantly, so did the Big Ten. Yes. You tried to align with these folks with the schedule alliance, and that lasted like six months before you got <laughs> torpedoed two ways. Number one, schedule-wise. Number two, they didn't give you the job that you were angling for, which was that commissioner's job. Right. Maybe they knew this was coming. I wonder. Sometimes those little inner inner circles have intel ahead of time. Like, hey, wait six months. There's going to be a problem at Northwestern. You don't want Jim. You do not want Jim. That's fascinating. I have no idea. All I know is that I was cracking up laughing when that whole thing went down. I thought it was all, we were already dead, you know, we were already screwed. And then he gets up there and ensures that your greatest fears are realized. Yep, yep. And that was, I mean, well, I, ESPN's I thought our partners too. They're in this too. Mm. Yeah, they are. And you know what? They got a great deal right now. Yeah. 
<laughs> Daddy screwed us. It was just something to behold. Well, I can, without any reservation, tell you that uh, the, what they're going to champion is that the ACC won more national titles than any oh, other conference. Oh, Christ. Yes, they sure will. I mean, that happened. That's, a, that, that's true. They always do. No, they always do. That's but, but that's what they're going to tell you. They're going to tell you that, hey, man, I know you guys think it's tough here in the ACC, but look at us steady winning national championships. And you want somebody to say, in sports that nobody cares about, my man. Right, exactly. That don't make us money is a better way of saying it. Like, hey, yeah. you know what? I care that the uh, FSU soccer program does well and that the tennis program does well. I'm an O. I care that all the programs perform exceedingly well. But I'm also a realist and a pragmatic, and I understand that none of that matters. If you have the best tennis program, lacrosse program, women's soccer program, beach volleyball program, it doesn't do you any good. No, it's just that's where my stomach turns going to this event is, you know, as a staff, the ACC group, they put on a really good event. The hospitality's fine. The, um, you know, the amenities are, are serviceable. It, it's presented well. Like, the staff does a good job. I'm not. This is not a knock at them. But my stomach turns because two years ago, you know, you've got the ACC Network launch, and they do a montage, and it's got F and Notre Dame football on it, which they don't even have the rights to. NBC does. Florida State's an oh, by the way, piece of that puzzle. And then last year, you got the neighborhood crap. Like, it's just, ugh. So what's it going to be this year? You know, that's my thing. It's like, what's it going to be? It's going to be something. But what's it going to be? When you sit down in a room uh, at the start of these events, it's always fascinating to guess what it is going to be, as you said. But in the last few years, just to let people know sort of the, the sense of what it's like to be here, you have a lot of the collective media that have done a good job of covering this concert, uh, conference for a very long time. And we all give each other that look like, you know it's over, I know it's over, you know this group wants to leave, you know the group that I'm covering wants to leave, you know that, and I don't mean the event, I mean yeah, the conference. Actually, yeah, speak to that a little bit more because you have those those connections. I mean, like, for example, we, we both remember Andrew Carter, but you go back further with him. Yeah. But, like, there's so many more than just a North Carolina reporter that you're you you're able to talk to behind the scenes. Yeah, I talk and to those. I don't, may, I don't have those conversations, so what's that like? Yeah, well, they usually come up, Oddly enough, I mean, for, for the longest time when those relationships were forged, when I first started going to these things, Florida State was on top. And so we were the, you know, the, the bell of the ball. And so it was yep. always people coming up, hey, what, what you're looking like this year, you think it's a national championship team? You think, right, you know, this right. and that. And then you had the stretch where Bobby was down and it wasn't working and, and they were talking about what's going to happen what's the university going to do? They're not going to force that guy out. How's this going to go down? And, and then later on with Jimbo, you know, he, even before Florida State became the dominant team, he had kind of taken over the room because Dabo had not established greatness yet. Right. And so Jimbo came in there as yep. a gunslinger and was not afraid. That's when and I that's first when you started. Kind of ended it. Yeah. 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 So I, I, we would have these conversations. They all centered around that. And I think, you know, the last few years, it's been a pity party. I've hated it. Um, you know, you've just waited for Dabo to enter the room and oh. everybody to flock to Clemson. Hey, man, he's getting his – we won't uh, see it. Ira is going to stick around for Thursday. But uh, the bronzer, he's getting that bronzer done. Yeah. He's going to come out straight orange. Oh, man. But, I, you know, this time around, Forest State comes back with a little bit of swagger, to overused word over the years. But this time around, I think they enter the room with the – a, we've told you all very publicly we're trying to get the hell out of this conference, and B, we may win it yeah. this year. Yep. Yep. So we matter again, and I'm interested to see how those conversations go. I, I do think that that's really going to be the talking point. How soon does Florida State push to actually leave? Is going to be the conversation, the behind-the-scenes conversation that everybody's going to ask us about. Because Alfred has been the most public, and you know, we know the alleged six or seven teams that said they would be willing to go along for the ride. And then there was kind of pushback from the conference. Yeah, and then he didn't do the right thing at Amelia Island. Uh, in my opinion, he did not. And mine as well. Others argue that that was a strategic ploy. It doesn't do any good. You've made your intentions <laughs> no, known. No, 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 no. Uh, no. You don't have to put lipstick on before you kiss the ass of the conference. Yeah, yeah. They call that a strategic ploy. No, I didn't. I, I wouldn't. I thought he, well, as I said at the time, I thought he overdid it. I, I, I thought he acquiesced too much. I would have just come back to say, hey, look, I think Jim's working and doing everything right. he possibly not his fault. If yeah. you say it, that energy, there's nothing wrong with that. It's not Jim's fault. Yeah, 
you can say that, right, absolutely. And um, yeah, so I thought that was interesting. But um, that said, hey, look, man, uh, this is this is really more about Florida State's chances of winning the conference this year, and then how soon can they get out? Chef Cameron Show, hour number two forthcoming. We've got a captive audience here in the car. It's us driving all the way to Charlotte, talking to you. Stay with.